Joining us now from uh, the 18th district here in Oakland County is Oakland County Commissioner Charlie Cavell. As the county is expected to be giving out uh, some 800,000 N95 masks to residents all throughout the county as we continue to deal with uh, COVID-19 with the Omicron variant. And of course, in the light of federal programs and state programs to distribute these masks to help prevent the spread of the highly transmissible Omicron variant. Uh, Commissioner Cavell, thank you for being with us today. Thanks for having me. You can just call me Charlie. Okay, I'll just call you Charlie then. So uh, first off, let's talk about that N95 mask distribution program. 800,000 masks uh, thereabouts that are going to be handed out to residents. Let's start off with the, with, with the basics of that distribution. How are those 800 masks going to go from the possession of the county to then be distributed out to the residents of Oakland County? Yeah, thank you for asking. So uh, first I want to recognize that this is like a tectonic shift in the way our government thinks about its role with our people, right? Doing something for the common good is something that uh, is always up for debate, especially in government. And since we're in a democracy, hopefully our whole community participates in it as much as possible. But what's really important about this mass distribution is first that it's actually happening in the first place, right? Because giving something for free, if you will, to the end user, because it costs money, but to the end user, the person getting the mask, it is free. Uh, that's a big step forward for our government, just FYI. Again, in terms of serving the common good, the way we're going to go about this is by the end of February, we want to make sure that cities, police departments, township halls, all the normal government places you might have to go to interact with your government and its politics will have masks available for you throughout Oakland County. And then going a layer deeper for organizations like uh, the JCC or Common Ground, other nonprofits in the area that might serve people, um, you can get a mask there. And then further afield, there's going to be individual distributions. So like I, as the county commissioner for the 18th district, I have a huge box of them and can request more at any time and have a bunch in my car. So, you know, I went to the Winterfest in Berkeley over the weekend and had a pile ready to give out to folks if they needed. We're so we're hoping to reach a pile of individuals. We're joined by Charlie Cavell, Oakland County Commissioner, representing District 18 here in Oakland County. And as he said, a number of different uh, municipalities, Ferndale, Hazel Park, Huntington Woods, and Royal Oak Township, as well as a portion of the city of Oak Park uh, being represented in District 18. And so where did that shift really begin? Uh, you mentioned that tectonic shift in the role that the government plays in protecting the public health and with these masks, mask distributions, because this is a lot, uh, this is this is a lot of product here. It's 800,000 masks. They're about available for free to the residents of the county. Uh, obviously, it, it's got some connection to the federal programs and the state programs that are in place to distribute these masks in reaction to the highly transmissible Omicron variant. But where does this process really start from having the, that availability to making this a county program and, and then working with partners throughout the community here in Oakland County in order to distribute these masks to people? Yeah, well, I appreciate you asking that question because I think this is an evolution of, again, the conversation that us as a people and our government through the process of democracy have been having since the pandemic began, right? We used to commonly say things like, well, that's a school that's not in my school district, so why should I be paying for them? Uh, that's not a road in my community, so why should I pay for that road? But the pandemic has really shed that discourse, I think, and allowed us to go a layer deeper in understanding, again, that if we're using our tax dollars, which again, we're not raising taxes to do this, so you're still paying the same, and without getting into the conversation of whether or not you're paying too high in taxes or too low in taxes, um, where we are is saying with the money we give the government every year in taxes, what the common good means has started to shift. And that's what I was alluding to when I was saying the tectonic shift is again, it's very rare for the government to provide something that is one universal, right? 800,000 masks, so that means everyone can have access to them and there's more on the way if needed. So there's that. Second, it, in addition to being universal, the second thing is that it is something that is free to the end user, right? I mean, I'm sitting here in the county complex. There are people that are shuffling in and out to the county clerk that have to pay for birth certificates for their kids, right? Even pieces of paper from the government are not free. Um, so being able to offer something free to the end user and then, again, uh, something that is universal I think is reframing what it means to have a common good and the government be of service in that role to you, which is again, a, a new way of thinking that we haven't had in a long time. And I'd argue is a good thing, right? It's nuts and bolts stuff, 
it's not super radical things. It's, well, we all agree that we all would benefit from these sorts of things. So if we can make it easy for people to get, we will. And, and so, Charlie, uh, on that note, mentioning that, of course, there's this wide availability for residents of Oakland County to pick up these masks, uh, to, to get them through a number of different outlets. And there's 800,000 of them, so there's plenty to go around. But eventually, the, these will run out because we're going to continue to be dealing with COVID-19. We're going to be continuing to deal with the Omicron variant and potentially other variants coming up that may be as transmissible, possibly even more transmissible than the Omicron variant. Has there been any discussion at the county level in continuing this program going forward? And, the, and more importantly, uh, the logistics of making that happen, should that, should that be necessary going forward when we get beyond uh, the Omicron variant and ultimately when these 800,000 masks have all been distributed? Yeah, great question. So there are currently conversations going on, have been going on since the beginning of the pandemic. So we have an ad hoc committee. So I'm going to say some bureaucratic government-y sounding okay. things, but the you who like know and understand local government, these words will mean something and then I'll explain. So we have a pandemic ad hoc committee that's been around since the beginning of the pandemic. We have a special study group that's working on emerging variants, which has come about since the Delta variant. And then, of course, we have the Public Health and Safety Standing Committee. So that means basically there is a super informal work group of people that is trying to, on the commission, elected by you, the residents, trying to figure out, working with county commission staff and the 5,000 employees in Oakland County government, many of whom are public health department employees, mind you. So working with the experts in their field locally here about what it means to address the emerging variant need address what the pandemic has brought us structurally. So that's thinking more economically and socially. And then third, there's the standing committee where we, um, I'm about to have to go to, um, that allocates the funds, right? That's the main job of the county commission is to discern whether or not XYZ project is worth allocating your taxes towards so that the executive can execute that project. So we have three layers of county commission government alone working on this in addition to the full-time staff of the public health department. Um, so we're definitely thinking about it. And the problem, though, has been because it's a variant and because Oakland County is where it is, just being in the middle of a state, in the middle of the country, uh, we're spending a lot of time reacting, right? So this is kind of like the, you know, the bank robbers in the 1930s. It was hard to catch Bonnie and Clyde because you're always reacting to where they were going to rob a bank next. So that's what we've been doing. But we've tightened that feedback loop of what it means to react to the Delta variant or the Omicron variant with these three work groups. We're joined by Charlie Cavell, Oakland County Commissioner, representing the 18th District here in Oakland County, joining us on the MegaCast. More information on everything from Oakland County's, uh, Oakland County's continued reaction to the COVID-19 pandemic and their work on the front lines by visiting our website, civiccentertv.com, uh, clicking on our coronavirus link, and at the top of the page, we have a link to Oakland County that will take you directly uh, to their COVID-19 specific webpage through the through the Oakland County Health Division, so you can learn more information on, of course, vaccines, on testing, where you can get uh, some of these masks that are being provided, these 800,000 masks being provided through this program in Oakland County, uh, and more information on COVID-19 as it comes in over time, uh, either at oakgov.com slash COVID or by visiting our website site, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus, and just click on that Oakland County website. I'll take you directly uh, to their to their COVID-19 specific web page and have all those easy links to get you more information you need to know on COVID-19. And so, um, again, we're joined by Charlie Cavell, Oakland County Commissioner from District 18. And of course, Charlie, in other news, uh, the districts have been realigned. This ha happens quite regularly, of course, with the county commission, but also as a result of the work of the Michigan Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission. Uh, you are a member of the eight of the 18th district and represents a number of cities. In the 2022 election for your upcoming term, you'll be running for the 19th district, however, representing Ferndale, Pleasant Ridge, Huntington Woods, Berkeley, part of Royal Oak, and most of Birmingham. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on the new district and some of the realignment that's happened from the Michigan Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission and how it affects uh, these districts here in Oakland County? Yeah, so I uh, break that into two parts, right? There's us and our team in the 18th, soon to be 19th district, and then there's the Citizens Redistricting Commission, right? Because the county had the authority to redraw its own lines out of some sort of weird loophole that was done back in uh, 2011. Mm -hmm. That was just kind of a, a strange occurrence that happened before my time. But the, so speaking first to the 19th district, I think it's great because 
Uh, currently, the district that I'm fortunate enough to represent, the 18th, is 77% Democrat, and I'm a Democrat. Um, and then the new 19th district is something like 58% Democrat in a good year. So what's good about that is people in hard right or hard left communities don't feel the need to engage oftentimes, I've found, from being in this world for several years. Sure. So this, though, requires us to not just mobilize for Election Day, but understand that politics and your government is taking action with or without you, whether or not you're participating, the other 364 days a year, not just on Election Day. So I think this is a great opportunity for us to engage people and empower them to understand that government is important, whether you like it or not, is part of your life, and it takes like a third of your money every year. So you should be participating in it. And it makes that argument way more saleable and palatable for people when you say, I also need you to help vote for me, please, <laughs> because it's not a shoe in like it was in the old district. So there's that. And I think trying to copy paste that with the Michigan Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission uh, with the one caveat that I think the benefit of us doing this in a democratic way was very good. But a democracy, again, is only as strong as the people who participate. So what you saw, or at least from what I saw, is towards the end, the redistricting started to get a lot of comments that were partisan, both from the right and the left. And so I think that influenced the group's dynamic of the, of the votes of the commission. And because it was the first commission, it sets the tone. And we got to give them some grace because they were the first. And they are normal citizens just trying to serve their community in our state. Um, but I think just to round this point off, the big thing is I think they kind of blew it with the Voting Rights Act VRA districts. So, for example, in our area, there's going to be um, just in practical terms, the voter turnout in Oakland County, which is a mostly white suburb, because, mind you, we live in Metro Detroit, which is the, according to The New York Times, most segregated metro area in the country. So we... Uh, have several districts for state house and state senate that kind of are long ribbons that go from Oakland County into Detroit. And I think uh, from a like philosophical or theoretical perspective, that is a good move. But practically what that does is it disenfranchises a bunch of black Detroit voters because the voter turnout is generally higher in white suburban Oakland County than it is in black city Detroit. Um, so that that kind of might be a miss on their part. But again, Time will tell and the election will show us if that's the case or not. And, and so, Charlotte, connected that at, to that issue in many ways, but, but a, a separate issue uh, in bulk is something we talked about the last time we had you on the Megacast as well. And uh, I, I want to give you some time to talk about the progress that, that may have been made uh, in this realm since we last spoke. Because, it, because, of course, as you're running for office, and we do this with any, with any candidate that would be on our show with issues that they are... Uh, that are important to them and important to their campaign. Uh, something that you brought up the last time you were on was the issue of fair housing, uh, fair, fair affordable housing being available in places like in Oakland County, uh, like in the suburbs of Metro Detroit that ultimately uh, are very much connected to the great segregation uh, between the city of Detroit and its metropolitan area. Has, has any progress been made on uh, some of the housing voucher discrimination issues here in Oakland County that you touched on last time that, that you were on? Uh, and it, it's been a long time, so mind me, I don't, ex I don't have the exact <laughs> date written down here when we last had you, but has any progress been made on, and if so, what progress or what discussions at least have been had at the county level on addressing housing discrimination and, and affordable housing? Yeah, thank you so much for asking that because yes, that has been quite a heavy lift and we have made huge progress. And so again, I wanna make sure I frame this in a context that's palatable for everybody sure. in that one, as you were saying on the, before the commercial break, when I was listening in, Kurt Metzger is gonna tell you about how Michigan has lost population or there are more deaths in Michigan yes. than right. in history. So that is emblematic. Second, Michigan is the is a state that is aging faster than the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. So that means one, it's not that we have more 65 and up individuals in Michigan than Florida. It means that more people in Michigan that are here are 65 and up. And that's not happening because in where in Florida, people are moving to Florida that are 65 and up. This is happening because in, in Michigan, this is happening because people that are under 65 are moving out of Michigan. So thinking about that broader global context, then you come into full view of the fact that housing prices are going skyrocketing here in Oakland County in particular, but throughout Michigan. So then talking about affordable and attainable housing really is the word we're using now because affordable housing conjures up 
you know, housing projects for people that are making zero dollars a year. What we're really focusing on is people that are making 120% of the area median income. So it's families that are making like 80 to $90,000 a year, but still aren't able to afford a house in Oakland County. So being able to help people that make 80 to $90,000 a year or less be able to live here is becoming a problem. And that's particularly a problem for the working age population. So millennials like myself, people with families, so people with two house with a double earning household income are finding it harder. And then what you're seeing is that spilling over into businesses where businesses in Oakland County before the pandemic and as we kind of hopefully come out of it are going to see that a lot of their workers live 45 minutes away in Macomb County. And just a comparison here real quick. Uh, when we were talking transit a couple of years in earnest around Metro Detroit, whether you like it or not is not the point. The point here is the biggest confluence of transit happening between the metro area, whether it's Detroit, Wayne, uh, Oakland, Macomb, or Ann Arbor, when we were talking about the big transit plan, was not between Oakland County and Detroit down Woodward. It wasn't Gratiot from Macomb to Detroit. It wasn't the airport. It wasn't into Ann Arbor. It was between M59 in Macomb County and Oakland County. So that's a huge symbolic thing that shows that tells us that people work in Oakland County but cannot afford to live here. So they drive 45 minutes away in Macomb County to get home. So that quality of life for the region is something that we can't ignore any longer. So that's what we mean when we were talking attainable housing, just to give perspective. But then drilling down to what we've done. Yes, we passed the source of income uh, protection ordinance, and that's being passed in several other communities. And source of income means people that are renting in Oakland County, which is about 160,000 families. Mm -hmm. So 160,000 families rent in Oakland County. And a third of the people that rent with housing choice vouchers, this is a thing that people can get discriminated with because of their source of income, is a housing choice voucher, a social security paycheck, uh, or a, a veterans housing voucher. So these non-typical, if you will, types of paying for your rent, that source of income not coming from you working a job, that makes up almost 40, these three sources of income makes up almost 40% of the people in Oakland County who are renting and almost a third of those people are 62 and up and using a housing choice voucher or social security to pay their rent. So this affects seniors greatly. So source of income is something in Oakland County that hurts a lot of seniors and lower income families that are working. And so what we did is we passed an ordinance that said, in Oakland County, if you're a landlord, you cannot deny someone access to housing simply because the source of income that they're using to pay is not what you'd expect, right? It's not a check from their bank account. It's a check from a type of, you know, social security, housing choice voucher, or housing, it's called the HVASH for veterans. So that atypical source of income is what used to be why a lot of landlords would deny people rent because there's an extra form to fill out. Um, but that's no longer allowed in many communities in Oakland County, and we're building that. So that was a huge change, which again, it's one of these things talking about the common good that we're able to provide as a result of pragmatic nuts and bolts government, right? It's, it's this is good for landlords because it allows them education, because in addition to passing the source of income ordinance, what we did is allow uh, create educational opportunities and information seminars for landlords to understand what these vouchers do and how this extra source of income is good for them. Because during the pandemic, when people like me, who is a renter, uh, was using money out of my bank account to pay my rent, um, I could have not paid my rent because there was a rent moratorium. But people who use source of income, like a voucher, like Social Security to pay their rent, uh, that rent was being paid throughout. So that actually helped landlords. So the timing was fortuitous but also again, showing that common good that landlords like this, people who use these vouchers to find housing like this, people that employ these folks that use these vouchers, which again is 160,000 families like this. Um, so this is something that we were able to get done. So that was a great thing. And there's a lot of education that had to happen because again, it's a mindset shift here in Oakland County from where we have been the last umpteen years, um, but a, a good step forward. I'm joined by Charlie Cavell, Oakland County Commissioner from District 18 on the Megacast. Uh, Charlie, just another minute or so with you before we'll say goodbye today. Anything else uh, that uh, you would like yes. to, uh, our audience so to know this time? Um, okay, so I'll say real quick, we're working at part two of housing is to make sure that housing is attainable for working families and millennials. We're working to make sure it, as it relates to housing that seniors are able to age in place here in Oakland County. 
And we're making sure that as it relates to child care, this is another big thing that we want to make sure child care is affordable for working families. And we want to make sure that child care is accessible to families. So making sure that child care businesses are able to expand their capacity and their workers are paid enough so that this is a career pathway. So Oakland County is working hard on attainable housing for the common good for most of our residents in multiple factions. And then second, we're working on child care to make sure that it is affordable and accessible for those families that need help with that. Well, uh, Charlie, thank you very much for joining us. Appreciate your time and your insight on uh, many of these different issues and programs here available in Oakland County. Thanks for having me.